out. It is now on. Okay, got it. And I will make sure to do captions, which I thought I had. All right, and it seems like one of our friendly local reporters is on the call, so everybody be on their best behavior. Yeah, hey there, Chris, because certainly this is not Hadley. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not the Hadley planning yeah. board. <laughs> We're all friendly here. <laughs> An updated copy, um, Megan's updated copy of the housing production plan did get posted publicly. So for anyone who's on the call, it is there on the town website. I would expect Judy to join. I know Judy's been having some things going on at home. As I said, I was expecting Don was going to join. Brent, um, I'm not sure. Um, I has something changed with Zoom? Are you familiar with captioning? Because I thought I was turning it on and it's not coming on. Subject. Well, there's something at the top of my screen that says a participant has enabled closed captioning. But we're not seeing it. Ew. Oh, well, now I see Dan, you know. Zoom, these Zoom clients constantly are getting updated. Now I see something at the bottom of my screen, a little button that says show captions. Do you see Mine that? Hide. You know, down where there's the chat, share screen, record button. Megan's nodding her head. So she's- Could you hit that and see if it comes up for you? Well, I'm not, I'm just logged in as like little old me, not like okay. the host. Right, but what mine says is hide captions. That's why it's fascinating. Oh, really? Um, subtitle settings. Do you full oh, transcript? Right. I don't want to do that. Now I have a button that says, now it says hide captions. And now the button went away. <laughs> it's still not coming up with. There's a button that came up that said host has disabled captions. Are and you now I've re-enabled them. Oh, but it's okay. it's still not showing. Awesome. No. Oh, and me. Oh, yeah. You don't want that to be speaking. Awesome. Oh, and me. Captions. Oh, awesome. Oh, and me. They just change these things so often. Oh, and me. Awesome. Oh. Let's. Is there a way to turn off? Okay. If necessary, we can just have it. If it's going to insist on speaking, we can make it speak Swedish, which will at least be enjoyable. Okay, so I don't know. I'm not having mine speak. Mine was talking to me. I was just hearing, I believe it was Judy. Oh, Judy is on the call. Okay. Disable, set up manual, subtitle settings. <laughs> All right. It's good that we're getting this. We always do these at the beginning of a recorded call for all for the benefit of everybody who watches these videos later. It's a sort of like a pregame show. Video isn't on. Yeah, so Judy, you're a big black square. I don't I don't know why. Uh, maybe the wrong camera is selected. Oh, I know. Camera isn't open. That would do it. Well, we definitely have a quorum now with, uh, we already had a quorum, but now that Judy's empty chair <laughs> is on video. Ah, good. Welcome. How are you doing, Judy? Uh, it's not been a it's been a tough day. Yeah. How's how's your husband doing? Well, he's his hip is doing well. He's developed some bizarre other symptoms, but anyway, his hip is progressing nicely. So okay. Okay. All right. Well, I suppose, like I said, I know Don knows about the meeting and was intending to be here since he called me earlier and said he'd 
see us tonight. But in the interest of just moving things along, why don't we just? Hi, can, oh. The 3501, 3401. Sure, I will forward you that link. Okay. Yep. Which email? This must be Dawn. Okay. That was done, I assume, Sarah? Yeah, okay. All right. You're muted. You're muted, Sarah. Yeah, you are muted. Oh. No, it went to something else. Anyway, I am going to email him the link. Okay. Maybe. All right. Uh, and do I have, okay, Sarah's given me screen sharing ability. So why don't we just, Don will be here any moment I imagine. So why don't we, um, meetings recorded for Mary. So I'm reading 5.06 PM, we'll call the meeting to order. And the first order of business tonight is a discussion of the revised housing production plan. Now, Megan, do you wanna share your screen with the doc? Like what might be a good thing to do is just kind of jump through the document since a few revisions were made since we last talked about it. So yeah. Sarah, if you don't have screen sharing permission, Sarah will have to give that. No, I gave it. I've got it, I've got it. Okay, very good. So what I would suggest, we sort of just walk through changes that have been made to the document since uh, we last reviewed it. Yeah, And then sure. we can have a conversation for about any questions or concerns. Um, and then I would, you know, basically, you know, unless there's, there's, uh, sort of a sentiment on the board that we can't or shouldn't vote on this tonight, I will formally make the motion that the planning board accepts this report. Um, but I think we'll do the discussion. And then at that point, it should be pretty straightforward to do a motion and vote. Great. Yeah. So last time we met, we taught, we went over the draft plan, um, along with all of the strategies that have been recommended. Um, just to reiterate that what the plan provides is kind of a menu of options for those who are implementing the strategies, whether it's the planning board, the housing committee, to um, go through and adopt those that they feel are applicable and um, might work for them, it, it, whatever the context is. So these are just really strategies that um, are recommended. They are not required for the town to do, but based on your zoning and what exists in the town, this is what we're recommending. Um, we had recommended a bunch of zoning strategies based on our last um, conversation and, and um, recommendations that have come to me is we talked about, so one of the strategies is, let me scroll up just a little bit, is uh, to increase housing supply where public transit is available. And we had in there um, having mixed use buildings and structures, particularly within the commercial district. Um, Judy had mentioned, um, and others had discussed this, was in addition to those potential options, and they're just options, is to also explore creating a mixed-use residential district somewhere where there's public transit available. Maybe that's on Route 5 and 10, maybe near Old State Road. Um, there's different options that could be explored, but this kind of sets that stage as a, a, as a recommendation that could be pursued in the future. Another change that was made, um, we talked about decreasing lot size in several districts. And um, based on feedback we received from the planning board, we have removed the commercial district from that discussion. And we are just focusing on um, the uh, AR1 and AR2 districts to potentially look at um, reducing the lot size in those areas. And that would be contingent where municipal water is available in studies show that we could um, reduce the lot sizes based on soil. Um, oh, and my screen just went dark. 
Uh, all right. Can you, okay. Let's see. My sharing stopped. So let me go back. Okay. Great. Still seeing and hearing you, so that's good. Okay. That's good. Um, all right. You do you see? Yep. Yep. It's back up. All right. It's back up for you, but now it's missing for me. Where did it go? <laughs> okay. I see it. All right. So, um, so uh, that was contingent on the soil being able to perk because we have no sewer, making sure that that works. And if that is a possibility, looking at it within the AR and AR2 districts. Um, other changes, uh, let's see, what is this one? Re-examining the cluster development bylaw, there are currently density bonuses within that, but no one has to date used those. No developers have used the density bonuses for affordable housing within that. So one of the recommendations was to examine, um, you know, are there ways to tweak this to make it more appealing to developers? Um, let's Especially see. if you're proposing expanding the lot size in AR2 because the two are intertwined. Right. Um, and then we also, uh, you would get a uh, wave, I think it was Judy, your recommendation to waive dimensional requirements in those districts that for affordable or senior only uh, lots. Mm -hmm. And another recommendation that was added was to create a developer grant program for affordable units. This is being done in some other municipalities in the state um, in which um, the town or housing committee or housing trust would provide developer money per unit to basically provide a subsidy for those units. There definitely would need to be some tweaks to, to figure out how that would work, but it is a tool that is being used around the state. I did have a question, just go back to that one. Yeah. That one I, was, I was puzzling over, just to make sure I understand it. Like, again, I'm looking at these as sort of notes to the future. Uh, and so I just wanna make sure that I, I can come away from this with clarity on what these things mean. So, First of all, I was puzzled by just the, the, the phrasing, just wave dimensional requirements, number one, which seems a, a little like a very broad statement. Waving just means sort of, to me, it take it to mean eliminate it, eliminating them. And then, you know, in certain zoning districts, this seems like the first time where these kinds of recommendations have been non-specific to which districts so i'm just curious megan like like maybe the easy one is why do you say certain zoning districts versus ar1 ar2 or um or in you know in residential in i'm just curious about the the intent of that language i just want to make sure why it was written the way it was yeah maybe. so um so wait, maybe I should answer this, Me, Go okay. ahead, Judy. Yes, go ahead. This was uh, my idea. And I was, as a basis, the, the uh, historic property um, reuse bylaw that um, maybe relax would be a better word than waive um, specific dimensional zoning requirements. Um, but it does allow if you take that as an example, uh, if something meets the required conditions for being a, considered a truly historic property, then you can waive certain setbacks, certain lot sizes, parking requirements, that kind of thing. I see. So it's like frontage might be reduced or, yeah, or um, setbacks. And, and I think you want the wording in whatever passes to be fairly broad because it, it will be a site-specific implementation. But I think one very obvious thing to me, I, I, this is like essentially like a, a friendly 40B, but it, it provides for special permit and site plan review. I see. And for the developer's point of view, they don't have to go through the whole process of an elaborate bureaucratic process of a 40B, which can be kind of painful. Um, I shouldn't say painful, time consuming. So 
I, I think that the first thing that comes to mind is a site, a parcel that's not big enough to qualify as a lot under normal circumstances. Okay. But if it's a good size and it would accommodate septic and parking and normal uses, um, then, and if the builder certified that it would be affordable or senior housing, then they could go to the ZBA and the ZBA could decide if it made sense or not. Okay. Okay. Does that answer your question? Do you feel like there's more change? It that does. I'm just, I would ask, so, and I'm not going to press this, but I'm going to ask Judy, since she's the originator of this, how she would feel if this were amended here and now to just read like wave or relax. Oh, relax is fine. Okay, in, in we're, place we're not, of not really, we're not wording the bylaw here, I think. Right, right. right. So relax specific dimensional requirements. And how about in, rather than in certain zoning districts, just in selected zoning districts? Works. Works. Yeah, this. So this you, don't even need, just, you don't even need that adjective. No, selected is fine. Okay. Let's we'll keep that in. Yeah. Okay. I think okay. That this provides the con. Yeah, and this provides time. just the concept for then to discuss later if this is something you decide you want to pursue, and then you would figure out what zoning district, how, what to, yep. what dimension requirements. Yeah. That's right. Okay. Okay. Um, and then let's see. So we um, Judy gave some great resources on information that could be provided as resources for seniors. Um, I've mentioned a little bit over here, including like the senior circuit breaker stuff. Um, it's, it's, I've had it further at the end where it was a big section on resources. So that is not really substantive change, it's just more information. Uh, let's see. I think those are the major ones as I'm scrolling through. Yeah, so the rest, most of the changes occurred um, Judy provide great recommendations in terms of resources that are in the end in terms of CPA, more information on that, um, senior senior resources, things like that. So nothing substantive though related further, any more changes to the actual strategies or recommendations. Um, at, since we last talked, I've gotten a little bit more input in terms of priorities. So at this point, um, what has been prioritized in the strategies is to Reduce barriers to accessory apartments. Uh, increasing housing supply where public transit is available. Uh, incentivizing affordable units. Uh, and that includes, so density bonuses, reviewing the cl uh, bleh, cluster bonus, cluster bylaw, where'd that go? There it is. Um, potentially reviewing, waiving, let's re change that. Relaxing the dimensional requirements. That is a potential priority. And two more priorities are to promote the development of new affordable single family homes in Waitley, either using friendly chapter 40B or going through developers such as um, HRA or Habitat for Humanity. And then another priority was um, exploring new housing on town owned or privately owned property, most likely would be town owned. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then finally, um, encouraging weatherization and clean energy in homes as a way to reduce housing costs. Um, and so not all of these are planning board strategies. Others are housing committee and others, um, although the zoning ones are obviously within the purview of the planning board and collaborating with others. That That is it. So that in a nutshell is the housing production plan. And those are the few changes that have been made since we last uh, talked and I will stop sharing now. Comments and questions from anybody on the board? Well, I think Megan's been very responsive and I thank her. There, I want to just revisit this one sort of the big picture is that there is a numeric target for housing production set forth in this plan. Could you, I'd just like to be reminded what that, or just for all of our benefits, like what that target is. Um, 
And I mean, in some sense, this report is a, bun a lot of these, you know, interesting possible recommendations for how we might go about causing more housing to get built so that we would meet or achieve this numeric target. Is that really a kind of a fair big picture takeaway of the report? Uh, and that that's if exactly right, yes. So the target, um, let me go through this. So was in the very beginning of the plan. And Kate, would do you think it would be your understanding that it is the housing committee's charge in all of this to somehow track progress, you know, like like the the building inspector doesn't send notices to the planning board when things get built, right? In fact, it's not always been clear that while we can email each other, there's there we just there's not a whole lot of information flowing back and forth. Um, so to the extent that new thing that people are building accessory apartments, you know, right. whether we make changes or not, like how it's really the housing committee's job to maybe foster uh, some kind of relationship, relationship. With the or whatever to find out like what's happening and yeah and and perhaps get feedback about why you know, I mean to the extent that things might have happened that didn't what is in the way that the, say the planning board or others might deal with. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that would be our, as you said, charge to sort of implement a system for monitoring that. Um, right. And I'm not initially entirely sure how easy that's going to be with the building inspector, right? Because sometimes information is a little bit hard to get, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised if they're already fairly familiar with having to track for other communities this type of change because I know that this is a kind of a hot button issue right so a lot of towns Megan's nodding that are, are making some zoning changes with these same intents so I'm sure even countywide they'll probably be starting to monitor and see what things are helping towns to lean in to have more affordable housing or or just rental housing units even at all yeah. Maybe I'd ask this question of you, Megan, since our building inspector works for the same organization that you do. Do you have any knowledge or experience for how communities that use FERCOG for their zoning enforcement and building inspection services um, stay abreast of what happens? Yeah, I think it's, it's so, I think it's incumbent on the town to ask. So, if you could once a year say, please give me a summary of all the permits that were issued or permits that were denied as well. That would, I think would be interesting information. Mm -hmm. um, and they're happy to give that and give it to you right away. And they can break it down by type, by year, by, you know, whatever you, you know, by zoning code if they want. Um, it's a pretty robust computer system. So that it's pretty easy for them to do that. It's just, you just need to ask. Okay, good to know. That's super here. Yeah, that is. That is reassuring. What was that numeric target again, Megan? So um, it's three units for one year certification and six units for a two year certification. And those certifications are the year, how long you will be protected against any unfriendly 40 Bs. So if you have to produce three units to be protected for one year and six units for two year protection. And these are, again are in the subsidized housing inventory. So we can be generating accessory apartments out the wazoo and, but they make no count. progress. Yeah, right. right, right. But the housing, yeah, the housing production plan is broader than just the objectives of, of increasing our subsidized housing inventory. But to the extent that we do that, we're protected from, the, from unfriendly 40Bs. That's right. The housing plan has identified that there clearly is a need for housing at many income levels. Um, and so not just the subsidized housing, you still need to have 
more housing choices um, and housing available for, for a variety of income. So accessory dwelling units could help fill that need, but it may not match and meet the, the specific subsidized housing inventory definition. At one first of the meetings over the summer. That, oh, go ahead, Judy. No, yours. Oh. At one of the meetings we had over the summer, and I can now no longer remember if it was a planning board or not, we had a discussion about like big A affordable housing and little A affordable housing, right? And some of these planning board changes are almost more geared towards sort of those little A sort of small baby steps towards more affordable housing so that people who maybe are seeking to move into town and can't, but aren't maybe necessarily living on an AMI under 100% or under 80%, but they could if we had just regular market rental housing available, I think. Uh, I think one I more thing that it's... makes sense because I'm not really sure that 40B, unfriendly 40B is a major risk for Waitley given given the lack of a sewer system and, and the economics and the, the fact that, you know, comparatively compared to urban environments, our land is, it, it's just not that attractive for a 40B, I don't think. But I suppose to some extent, if we over time make progress on these kinds of goals is, outlined in this plan, then we can at least say that we're part of the solution rather than part oh, of sure. the problem. Well, it's all it's all part of the solution. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Did I hear a voice? Was that you, Don? Uh, yeah, just one of the things that we can keep in mind is that uh, we can get access to uh, all the permits that come in to the building inspector and check them out weekly or something just to see what is going on. Is that so? And how does that happen, Don? Um, I think just call FERCOG and, and ask to be uh, included on the people that can log in. Yeah, Don was doing that. Yeah. I'm sorry, I, Judy, what was that? Don was doing that for a while. I don't know if he's kept it up. I see. I, I have not kept it up. I stopped about a year ago or so. Okay. So if we wanted to, so we so we could be granted login access to the database, and then it's up to us about when to go ahead and do that. Is that sounds? So I'm happy to. So those things tend to. How about I'll I'll plan just looking into what's involved in doing. Oh, for that. the so meantime. Personally, what was that Judy? For the meantime, I'm not sure. Accessory apartment requires a special permit at the moment. Um, as um, so, if we're looking for those things, I'm. I think we can just monitor the ZBA's agenda. Okay. Okay. So, any other comments or questions about this report? I mean, from my perspective, on both boards, and I will say I've just. Signed up for yet another year on the housing committee, yay. Uh, got sworn at at the town offices. So, um, so I think that there's a, the, the way to move forward after this plan is a collaboration with the housing committee around what really are the priorities driven, not just by conceptual priorities, but the kinds of things where we have the human resources between the planning board and the housing committee to actually invest time and energy and like figure out what are the what are the areas where we're ready to put in effort and and have the most impact we can for that effort does that sound right to you kate yeah absolutely okay well um so i'd like to i'll make a motion that the planning board accept the housing production plan dated July 5th as amended at tonight's meeting. Those couple of little word changes. Second. Motion has been made and seconded. Of course, Robert's rule says now there's time for discussion. Okay, 
Uh, hearing none, then we'll do a roll call vote. Um, Sarah? Accept. Aye. Tom? Aye. Accept. Judy? Aye. Don? Aye. Grant is aye, so it's unanimous. That's super, you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, Megan, for all your work. So now let us tell us what the next steps are with this report and any recommendations that you have for the planning board in the like immediate future. Okay, so the, the very next step is we'll take this now that the plan that you have endorsed with the amendments today to the select board to do the same thing to have them endorse the plan. Once that is done, then we will submit to the state for our review um, and they will uh, let us know whether it's been accepted or not. Um, and then you'll have an approved housing production plan. And then you can get to work and start start picking away at the little items and start, you know, what do you think might work today or this year or next year? Um, the next kind of short term step for the planning board generally in terms of housing is that the town is about to embark on a comprehensive plan visioning process. And so um, housing clearly is going to be an element of that and the planning board would have a role for that. Um, but just in generally, what will your vision for Waitley be? We're going to be reaching out uh, to, to the planning board, to other boards and, and committees to understand what the town's vision is over the next 20 years. What do you want Waitley to look like? We've heard today from you guys, you know, it's going to need a mix of housing that's affordable to all and different types, um, but it's also going to be broader than that. So um, that'll be kind of the next planning process for you guys to think about. What, if anything, should be done by any of us um, to assist the select board in what they have to do in terms of reviewing and, and voting on this? Should we communicate with them or, you know, how does that work? Uh, great question. So it, it depends on town by town. Uh, you guys know your town best, I would say. Um, Usually, in my experience, the select boards will feel comfortable endorsing it if they know that the housing committee and the planning board have already kind of done their due diligence. Um, but you guys know your town best. Um, sometimes it helps to attend the meeting um, or just shooting them an email or, um, you know, a, a letter saying, you know, we have endorsed this. We are confident that it is appropriate for the town of Waitley. Um, that might be sufficient. But um, you guys know their town best. Yeah, I actually started, I draft, I started typing an email to Fred Barron to update him. And then it occurred to me in the email that uh, at this point, I should just wait until after today to send it as opposed to saying to him, great, we've done this and we've met and now there's a meeting for a vote in less than 48 hours. And I kind of just stopped typing at that point, like, right, I'll just save this in my draft. So I'll, I'll send him an update email tomorrow and I'll ask him, um, since he's the committee member also on the housing committee, because I was thinking, you know, I had wanted to try to have another housing committee potentially meeting before the select board meeting. I know, Brant, you have a vacation. I have a vacation immediately following your vacation. So I just want to check it. I know it's the worst. It always happens in the summer. So I wanted to check in with Fred about where he was landing on that, what he thought would be necessary and most appropriate, and kind of just let him take the lead I'd be amenable to trying concurrently to getting on the select board agenda at some point you know maybe it'll be by the end of August anyway and also trying to get a housing committee meeting that's near that end of August maybe so okay and so Megan you do have to produce the final final draft and there there were results you know things in this draft that still are not included in the report that I saw wrote survey results and things like that. The last, yeah. so, so yeah, all of so, that will be put together so that that can go to the select board. Yes, yeah, I already have them all packaged ready to go. I just wanted to keep this in the word version so you could see the track changes, and just the changes that we discussed. Okay, and I'm happy with you, Kate, to attend the select board meeting, just to be on hand okay. if there are any questions related to. Super. I appreciate that. Thank you. If he can't make it, if it's, I, I, I'll do it. Good. Thank you, Judy. Okay. Yay.
Okay, and I think <laughs> we can declare victory on this and wish you good night, Megan. Wonderful. Kate, and we'll get on with other planning board business. Thank you all. All right, all right thank Thanks you. Thanks again. For all your work. Yeah, really, thank you, Megan. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Bye. Bye. All right. So the next topic on the agenda was one of mine. So I circulated a letter, a draft letter, and I'm going to share my screen. This relates to the Aquifer Protection District boundaries. So I'll just, didn't get any comments, but that's not, not an issue. All right. So it, it occurred to me that it just might make good sense before trying to just do a lot of poking around and trying to gather information to just write down a letter and basically, and I think it was even Tom who suggested that this might be a, well, and, and, and also Brian that just submitting a request to the water department could be at least a good step forward and maybe even if necessary, getting to the mass DEP. So I drafted this letter uh, and I did CC it at Judy's suggestion to um, Wayne, the water department superintendent and the water commissioners. I CC'd it to the conservation commission. I think I also CC'd the board of health and Nicholas Jones specifically. Um, I have not received any responses from anyone but Nicholas Jones. Nick, Nicholas, one of the first requests was documentation of the formal abandonment of the water district public water supply. And Nicholas did in fact have an electronic copy of the related document. Uh, I saved it on OneDrive. I don't know that we need to look at it or discuss it, but I believe I've received a response Response. I've received at least some documentation and it, I have to look at it and just ascertain whether it seems to be complete. Um, but really the feedback I wanted from all of you is really number one, how do you feel about the strategy? Write a letter. I, mean, I, I think in our town, we tend to just shoot people emails, but for some reason it felt to me like doing this in a little bit more of a formal way, writing a letter, sending it to the water department made sense. Maybe all of you who've been around in this town longer than I have might say, oh, just send this all by email and you'll be fine. Um, but I also thought it would just be a good occasion to write down a, a description of what I think, what, the informa what our information needs are to decide whether and, and how, whether, if, if, and how to change the aquifer protection district boundaries. So I'd like to just see if there's any feedback from any of you on what's in the letter, what's not in the letter, the strategy. Um, yeah. Thoughts? Opinions? Well, I think this, the uh, suggestion that on the letter that I saw that we revisit the whoever made the initial delineations. And uh, my thought, uh, as I've stated before, is that um, upland from where the city's town water stops, uh, maybe it would be good to keep those regulations in place to protect future property owners. But uh, it, it evidently some people don't think that's uh, needful. So uh, I, I don't, I'm not married to uh, keeping those changes. Okay. My sense, Don, is that this is an attempt to clarify what we have to keep as opposed to what we want to keep. Right. May be the same, they may be different, but 
what we have to keep, we have to keep. Is that right, Brent? I believe what I what I believe I've heard, and obviously I'm not as schooled in this as say Nicholas or the water department staff, but what I've gleaned from a conversation with Nicholas and also with uh, Ryan Clary at FERCOG is that the that zones one and two have formal definitions that I think are the same, more or less the same as our definitions in our zoning bylaws. But, but the DEP defines what a zone one is and defines what a zone two is and mandates that public water supplies protect their zone ones and their zone twos. And the mass DEP does the work to delineate zone, well, these two zones. The zone ones are very easy because they're basically a, a radius around the wellhead. So once you know where the wellheads are, zone ones are straightforward to delineate. They're just a circle. Zone twos are more complicated and zone twos, again, I'm just giving you my understanding of the basis for zones one and two, that they're, they're in their DEP requirements and the DEP defines zones one and two. I'm told that the DEP does not define a zone three and that we and Waitley have done that ourselves for additional protections of our aquifers. But there is no DEP mandate for a zone three as defined in our bylaws. There's no DEP definition of what a zone three is. That, that's definitive, Brent? I don't, I, I would, don't let me say definitive. I'm feeling very, I'm feeling reasonably confident that I've understood properly zones one and two as based in state law and that those zones are delineated by the DEP. Ryan, the GIS specialist, at FERCOG said, he, you know, he basically gets the zone two definitions from the state, not from the town, the zone two definitions. But he said that to his knowledge, having done maps, zoning maps for many other towns with aquifer protection districts, he said, Waitley, I think he said, don't quote me on this, um, I think he said Waitley's unique in having a, having zone threes. So that's what I've, that's all I know at present. So I don't know where the zone threes, what I guess I was told is that the zone threes, well, I don't have a clear, I don't have a clear understanding of the origins of the zone three regions in our map. I don't know who created them. I just don't know the provenance of them. But apparently the zone threes did not come from the state. Well, the problem is that the, the way I read the zoning bylaw on page 75 and 76, it says that they come. For the purpose of this district, there are hereby established within the town four aquifer protection district areas, zone one, zone two, zone three, so, and an interim wellhead protection area. The criteria used to delineate these areas are set forth in the mass drinking water regulations and are described in the source water assessment assessment program reports prepared by the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection for the Waitley Water District and the Waitley Water Department. So I have, would interpret that to mean that, that the drinking water regulations define where there's a precise measurement and the, these studies define the rest. 
And I remember Nicholas saying, I asked once how the boundaries were drawn. He said, well, we basically put them where the DEP said, said we should. And again, I assume that was based on the studies. So if the studies aren't being used, and the studies would be town specific rather than generic across. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm reaching back on this. Um, but, but Grant, you're, you're, interpreting, you're interpreting, I think, this is not my re recollection of how it went. Um, it wasn't just a group of people sitting around the table who said, Gee, let's do a let's do a, a, a zone three and make it make a definition. It was based on conversation with, with UMass geologists, the DEP. Um, there was a lot of um, hand wringing about where the boundary was um, on the lower Westbrook Road, um, Chestnut Plain Road. Uh, you know, how far it went into Hatfield. So there there was hard evidence and data that went into constructing that. I don't know what to say. Like I said, I'm, I'm just getting my head into this. I have obtained the source water assessment and protection report for the Waitley Water Department, which I'm screen sharing now. And you'll notice in this box, they on the left in the sort of pink bluish box, they say what a swap is. And then they continue on down. And by the way, you can see the date on this report was uh, what was the date on this report? Well, I know from the final name it's 2002. All right, but um, in the glossary of the swap report, they define a zone one and they define a zone two. They don't define a zone three. And as I've at least skimmed through this swap report, I've seen no mention of a zone of, zo of zone three. Uh, well, there's a zone three. Okay. So I I I it was incorrect. So there's no, I a think definite... I think we need to be more, more careful about um, how this is being dissected. Yeah. Um, the, the 2003 source, source water assessment and protection report. Um, states that the aquifer along I-91 has a high level of vulnerability to contamination uh, and so on. Um, and that was in the spirit and the goal of the original zone three definition. And remember that, that, that this, that the driver for this whole initiative was the loss of the aquifer in East Waitley. And the, this is the aquifer, the zone three as it was, was emerging was um, polluted in some form, the town would be in a, in a serious both financial and resource support situation. And so I got I, the question I have is what, what has evoked this review? Well, I know, I know, I know um, uh, Dan Denny had a question about a very specific question about some property he had. How, how have we gone from that to this broader question of zone three and who did what? What, what? What's the driver for this? Yeah. So really, just sort of back to the letter. Um, the driver for this is it has been, I have been told Remember that we have in our zoning map, two zone twos and two zone threes. We've delineated aquifer protection boundaries initially to protect the water department public water supply. And then when the Waitley Water District became a public water supply, that brought a, along with it legal requirements to in zoning protect that public water supply. And so additional zones, protection zones were delineated to protect the water district supply. So now that the, the water district supply has been formally abandoned, 
I am told there is no legal basis or justification for the town of Waitley to maintain restrictions on land use uh, relate that are related only to the protection of the now abandoned water district public water supply. And so the driver of all of this is to figure out if all we need to do, well, first I'll ask the question is, are we now in a situation where all we need to do as a town is protect the water department public water supply? Don sort of, I think is asserting, we put all of these protections in to protect water, protect future um, landowners, homeowners who may need wells or whatever, and that there may be, there may be a, a reason or a rationale other than the existence of the water district supply to retain okay. existing boundaries. But the driver for this is really ask the question, what are the what boundaries must we maintain? Okay, I think I've got an answer for that. We added a, a new uh, district three or zone three uh, north of the wellhead. And be, because um, the geology up there means that anything that falls up to, I don't know, halfway up Dickinson Hill, um, is going to get into uh, different fractured uh, rock zones and would come down and infiltrate into uh, the wellhead protection area around the Whaley Water District. That, that zone three no longer needs to exist. The zone three that is just north of um, Chestnut Plain Road over in the near West Brook um, does need to stay there. And that, that was one of the original zone threes. So my recommendation would be just to delete the zone three uh, north of the former water district. Well, so what I'm not trying to accomplish tonight is have a d discussion and vote on specific actions because I don't feel qualified even with Don's recommendation to, to take that action. I've seen a map given to me by Nicholas where Nicholas asserted to me that there was a zone two and a zone three on our zoning map that are they were created specifically to protect the water district. However, the zone two that was created for the water district overlaps to some degree with the zone three for the water department. And so you can't just eliminate, so Don has proposed, we'll just eliminate the zone three for the water district, leaving the zone two for the water district, but that may still be more than we need. So really all I'm trying to do is get ask the right questions what are the what are the board what are the boundaries of zones two and three that need to be delineated to protect the water department public water supply full stop it's really all i'm asking just right. somebody yeah. give me those boundaries well the water that's coming from the north um is protected uh, along um, Chestnut Plain Road, uh, but where the, we get out of the, um, uh, the bedrock uh, over near the, the former water district, that is not going to percolate down because it basically goes due east rather than to the to the east and to the west um, to the east and south. Okay, so somebody's sharing this, right? Yes, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm trying for the screen, right if, screen, but I don't have the right screen, obviously. I, if you unshare, I have the right map ready Thank to you. go. I did, but I just chose my wrong. Oh, okay. Do you? All right. Oh. 
Belmont. Has anybody sat down and compared the water district study that the DEP did with the water department study? Because the way the, the zoning reads, it's when it describes the map, it says that the map includes the newly defined zone two and expanding zone three for the three bedrock wells in the Waitley Water District period. And if you look, the, the water district study came after the water department study. So no, it would seem to me if reports. you started with that as a framework. So I've looked at both the swap reports. They're downloaded. They're in a folder in OneDrive. It's frustrating that the both of the swap reports that I've been able to obtain through online access at DEP refer to delineated you know, maps with the boundaries, but I cannot, they're not somehow for some reason, they're not part of the report. I've been unable to find them. So yes, you, you I tried suppose, Kimberly. Judy, that I could start burning a lot of my personal time well, to no, pick I just, up this information. I didn't mean that you should do it, but maybe that's, maybe rather than, I really can't see Wayne doing it either. Is, is, I'm, um, it would be my ex expectation, and I may be wrong, but my expectation is that the water department should have the right records accessible, and they should know they are obligated not only are they operating our water supply, they're obligated to, I would expect, they're obligated to know what, where the boundaries are of these zones, rather than me, who's a non-expert in water supplies or anything like trying to find this. So I wanted to at least start with the water department. And if it turns out like they should throw up their hands, we don't know, then I guess the next step would be going to the DEP and then I want to contact because I'm not going to phone up the general 800 number for the DEP to start asking questions. Did did uh, did you check with Kimberly about the maps? Uh, I spoke to Kimberly, and Kimberly said to me that FERCOG has may have delineated the zone three. I have not, I didn't ask her specifically, do you have the delineations? And I suppose since Ryan Clary, the GIS specialist said that he gets the zone two delineations from the state that would seem to imply that he can get them. So I may do all of these things. I think so Tom said, Tom said at an earlier meeting that Kimberly worked with the people putting this stuff together. Am I right, Tom? She was involved? Kimberly McPhee. Kimberly McPhee. Yeah, she was a, she was a primary drafter of this yeah. bylaw. Yeah. Um, and UMass was involved, I'm, I'm certain UMass was involved with the delineation. And I think, again, dealing with the natural world and, and it's succeeded in, in the crisis of East Waitley, th these are bureaucratic definitions. And I, I doubt very much, and Don can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, that water doesn't stay within these, these little polygons that have been created. That, that it's a fluid environment, no pun intended. And that that water, 10 feet over that boundary, um, may, may be water that is going into this, the zone that is where it's out of. So I think we need to be careful about saying we don't need this, we don't need that, as though the water is going to where a polluted well has been put in, the water is going to stop at the boundary of where the ink is and not get into the into the rest of the aquifer. And then we're then we're revisiting East Waitley all over again. And that was yeah. the spirit in which this was happening. It was it wasn't a bureaucratic exercise. It was our friends and neighbors were, were de um, denied access to fresh water for their families and their farms and so on, we can't let that happen again. Right. I should be clear, I am not advocating, um, 
I'm really just trying to understand what, what we need to do and what we should do as a community. I'm not advocating. I live in East Waitley, all right? So I care about the safety and protection of the public water supply. Let's be clear about that. I'm not some activist trying to say, let's get rid of all of this protection, we don't need it. No, I'm just trying to understand what's the basis for it and what do we really need now that one of our public water supplies has been abandoned. And it seems like a reasonable first place to start is people who know public water supplies. So I drafted a letter that I proposed to send to the uh, to the water department, and I'm going to see. I, I'm. I don't see this as urgent either, right? You know, it's months have passed since town meeting, but um, and I'm not spending my days worrying about this. But I was going to write a letter, send it to the water department, and see what they say, and then we will go from there. Grant, um, what, just to, just for discussion purposes, what if we take this issue completely, put it on the back burner? say, we'll revisit this sometime in the distant future. What, what individual or constituencies would come out and say, why aren't you re-examining those boundaries? So uh, you can all, this planning board, if you wanna make a vote, then what I would say, my re response to that is, we are a, a board of citizens that have an obligation to, um, protect our community, but not excessively so. We may, reasonable people may differ on what it means to excessively, um, you know, protect the health and welfare of this community. There's a slippery slope argument, Tom, where why don't we just turn the whole town into a zone three? I mean, well, who's, but let, let me ask, who's made that proposal? I'm, I'm trying to get it, where is this coming from? Who's made that proposal that we need to think about? So I, I will I will again point out that the question came up at the select board. Nobody is banging, um, you know, banging their sword saying that's a terrible metaphor. No one's uh, you know up in arms saying how come we're you know we're still under these protections and these restrictions and we no longer need to be. I mean, I suppose aside from at least one property owner in town. Um, that's not what's motivating me. Yeah, I just figure we as a board, we made certain changes to our zoning bylaws at this last cycle, driven by the fact that we knew the water district had been abandoned. Right, we had I a discussion what, about these boundaries. Knowing, knowing the history of all this, and then the, the, crisis in the community, why isn't it, why aren't we saying, you know, based on that 2003 uh, SWAG report, aren't we saying, do we need to incre increase the size of the bound of these, these areas? If this, is, if this is our one water supply left, maybe we're being too conservative in the size of this area. But the conversation is about reducing. And I'm, I just, where is that? Why aren't we saying, why aren't we putting stronger protections on it? Our water because it's our last source of water in the town of Wayne. We can certainly end up having that conversation too. I think, and, and I think climate change is another reason with the massive but, amounts but this of water. Is what I'm getting at, that this conversation is, is evoking certain questions that I'm not sure have any basis in reality. They're, they're, they're curiosities. You seem to be saying that we should not, as a board, ask anybody whether the existing boundaries are um, adequate or needed or anything like that. We should just table the whole thing. No, 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 I didn't, I'm not saying that at all. I'm okay. just saying if we were to table it, who would come out and say, you have to do this or do that? I'm just, what's the motivation? Well, isn't this how we operate as a board? Like. Ever since, ever since I've been here, Judy, for example, has instigated any number of zoning bylaw revisions that were not driven by, you know, anything except, gee, hey, maybe these marijuana couriers could be an issue, or maybe this, maybe that. We are trying to use our best judgment as uh, 
town citizens as to what we should be doing relative to zoning bylaws in the interest of the town. And it seems to me that protection of the water supplies in our town is given that, that it is reflected on our bylaws is something we should be concerned about. I also just wanna point out, I am, the letter is not about necessarily just about reducing boundaries. I'm just asking, we no longer have a water district, we have a water department. From the water department's perspective, what are the, what are the boundaries? What do we need to protect? This is an opportunity for the water department to weigh in. I certainly, I'm not as you, as, as you recall, in our conversation, I, I promoted the idea of getting the experts involved, including the water department. Yeah. So I, I'm just acting on that. I think it makes sense to send the letter and get clarification about what the boundaries of the water district zones are. And are perhaps also to get a better understanding as a subsequent step for why they were there. And then okay. I think Tom makes a very good point that perhaps the, the real question should be, what should the boundaries be? And that's, I, I can think of, you know, his point about one, one water supply now um, also, as I think about the kinds of changes in climate and flows that are occurring because, because of these incredible storms we're getting now, that might reasonably change things too. Um, I, I don't know, Don probably thinks I'm crazy, but I don't know enough about geology, but they seem to be changing everything else. Um, so I, I think this is a good first step. I want to be careful. I think Tom makes a good point. Second step probably should be let's let's think about what what the ideal would be now. Okay, back eight or nine, maybe or actually probably more than that, probably 18 years ago, uh, zone three was expanded uh, to protect the water um, district. And so if we got rid of that old zone th or, or the new zone three, which shows up basically from um, Haydenville Road and follows it up, um, that other zone three was definitely in the original um, plan to, for delineation as well as the zone two. So, because uh, I remember we hired the state geologist and another geologist to take a look at where that water was coming from, and they followed it back up and found out where the slope of the um, the original bedrock comes from from the north. And once you get above um, that area. The, there's the where the rock is 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 much more fragmented, and it's no longer in a zone that tilts to the towards the south. Mm -hmm. So that to me that would be what I would get to, but I would also check with a state geologist because he's also a uh, a hydrologist. I agree with that. Those are the people that helped to store these boundaries originally. It Sarah. looks like we need to eliminate the second zone too in the middle of town because isn't that by definition directly about where the wellhead was that's no longer in use? But that same area should probably be reassessed and maybe expanded depending on what the town now wants for protections of our one well. How arduous is the process to have all this reassessed? Because it, it looks like re, zone two, the second zone two needs to be reassessed and to become a zone, partially zone three or expanded completely into zone three or even expand more. But Tom and Dawn, I know, has been very directly involved in these processes. How arduous is this? 
Well, one of the things that you have to have to understand is the zone three for the for our, our main wellhead. Um, the reason that's the zone three is because when Lake Hitchcock was there and it drained, a lot of gravel came down into that area, and that gravel is very permeable. So any rain draw, any rainfall that falls along Westbrook Road is going to go directly into the gravel and directly down into the uh, the old floodplain, and we have a shallow aquifer there. So it's it's a direct protection for anything that that any rain that falls directly north of the wellhead. Because that, that gravel is very, very that, permeable. And that water is not going to stop at the boundary of a polygon drawn on a map. It's going to continue to permeate and gravity is going to bring it down slope, join it with the larger aquifer, and then it'll make its way out from there. So do we need to expand zone three for additional protection? So well, let me just. I think that that should be part of the conversation, not just right. what the conversation has been. How do we reduce? And if you follow the wind spread principle when making these kinds of decisions, it's often well, we'll continue to pollute until you prove prove to me that it's not good to pollute. The wind spread principle says you don't pollute until you have the data to know that you won't pollute by taking these actions. But it's always let's reduce it first. Have a crisis and then we'll fix it. You, you, don't, you just look around the planet. Yeah, I'm covered with these issues. Just on your point, Sarah, Nicholas showed me a map, which again he couldn't sort of say much about where it came from. But if you look at what we're you screen share, sort of there's this the towards the bottom of the screen is the zone two, you see the zone two. What I'm discussing. Well, no, that zone two that you're, you're mousing over is was added to protect the water district, right? It's no longer. Right, right. There. But here's the point. What Nicholas suggested is that before that zone two was, so the water district mm -hmm. was added after the water department. So, Right, so there was a zone two for the water department and there was a zone three for the water department. What Nicholas has showed me is a map that it seems to indicate that the original zone three for the water department included a sub significant amount of what's now shown as zone two for the water district. Right, that's right? why we need to reassess. Right. Yes. And in, in a way, we kind of need to know what were the original zones two and three for the water department. And yes. that, like, we no longer know what the original zone three is. The original zone two, I think we know it has not, not been changed. Right. This all. Area. Right. That's right. But it's it's the zone two and the zone, it's the zone three for the water areas. Department. Yeah, that area. And how much of this area was part of, right. Yeah. Would, would, uh, would the town clerk have a zoning map prior to April 24th, 2007? I did ask Amy Schrader that question when she was still town clerk. And um, she, she didn't seem to know how, whether it was, a, you know, whether or how she would go about finding such a thing. I'd have to believe it's there, but. Yeah, so because, because, friends, because, because the way the. I mean, there are minutes taken at all these meetings. I mean, we're, doesn't Kimberly have a, re yeah. a record of all these meetings and the minutes that were taken? These are, these are all public meetings or minutes right. taken. Um, so, people came in, experts came in and talked to the, to the planners. Well, I did the GIS. I did the GIS on this on this map and created recreated the zones. Um, and I am pretty sure that I have what the original zone was is somewhere on my computer. So I can check that and get back to everybody. 
it'd be worth knowing we need more than a map. We really need GIS precise data delineating these boundaries. We need it georeferenced. Can't just take a piece of paper and then lay it down accurately on a georeferenced map. Well, you're not being a cartologist. Um, all of this stuff is georeferenced. Yes, that's right. That's right. What I mean is that if we, if somebody gave us a paper map with drawn boundaries. What I, what I do when I get some of that is I scan the paper map and then I do a, a, a thing called georeferencing and I make what is on the map fit what's actually on the ground yeah. by picking points, road intersections, anything that is not going to be changed over the course of 10 or 20 years. Mm -hmm. So that, that stuff is all good to within probably 20 or 30 meters. If so John has the map, then presumably, yeah, you might have the georeference files as well, but presumably he could work backwards from that. But again, I'm not, and I don't think any of us tonight want to take the position that the right decision is to simply restore the boundaries of the zone two and three for the old water department and be done with it. Because I think Tom still has the valid point, like, well, should we just leave everything in place because it's there regardless? And so there's still more work to be done. But I'd at least like to know what, what would we have to protect by law if we were just protecting the water department? And we're still able to do additional protections, I suppose, until somebody raises a legal challenge to that. Um, so I'm going to go... I guess I'm going to go ahead and send this letter. I mean, unless somebody wants to make a motion and vote this whole idea down. I would say send the letter. No, send the letter. Because it's just gathering information. And that's all I really wanted to accomplish. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll give you another read, though. Does the letters talk about expanding or contraction of these areas, or does it only talk about contraction of the areas? Uh, it doesn't, I think, let me look it at the wording of the letter. Draw. Sarah, sorry, say sorry. that again, Sarah? It says redraw. So. Yeah. I intended it to be very neutral to that question. That's, that is neutral. Okay. Maybe well, you could phrase it just as. Maybe if. The letter will recast a little bit to talk about the sequential development of of the map and you know any records you can provide about the original the original water district the original water department map and the subsequent combined map to help us understand the difference or or the delineations. I can make that change. We're not necessarily going to redrawing yet we're still assessing and receiving information right right like i said if if the outcome of all of this is no change then i'm i will feel good as long as it's no change based on you know appropriate evidence and decision making Absolutely. what i don't want to do is just say I don't even want to know. We're just not going to take any action until somebody complains. To me, that feels wrong. Given what we know of a one public water supply being abandoned and assertions having been made that that eliminates the basis for certain land use restrictions. That's all. Okay. Well, all right. I've got someplace I've got to be in 15 minutes. So I am going to uh, bow out at this point. I'm happy to close this out and I think- We want to vote on minutes? Oh yeah, let's vote on minutes. Um, I looked at Judy's mint changes. Um, so for, this is for February 22nd. Is that, that's right. All right, so we've officially closed the conversation. Just to close that loop, I'm gonna make, just re review my letter and make sure it's neutral on the question of whether we're really going to eliminate anything or, you know, just, and, and add it, 
uh, request for any data on like the original map and documentation for the water yeah. department. All if right. I can find that stuff, I'll I'll send it out to everybody. Okay. That'll be good. And I'll I will happily send some inquiries over to Kimberly um, just to see what because you know, I probably maybe I didn't really ask the right question because I didn't even know the right question to ask at the time. But I'm I, I'm trying to also preserve my own time and sanity on this. Like yeah. I just wanna go step by step and ask people who I think should have the stuff and just give it to me before I start doing an open-ended calling and digging around. All right. So okay. So um I'm good with the February 22nd minutes, do we have to put them up for any reason on the screen? No. Will we accept them as I had two questions. Two. One, two questions, I think, in there. One okay. was whether we needed to include the whole bylaw proposal in the text of the minutes, because that seems excessive to me, since she references the file subsequently. And the other was, she seemed to, there was a place where she implied that where the wording implied that DMCTC was already a light manufacturer. And there isn't and that category. So I said it either needs to be that they want to become or that they are not. You know, I think I gave two possible wordings. Okay. So with those changes, I would be prepared to accept and approve the minutes. So no, I, these are questions, Brant. I yeah. recommend removing the word light. Okay. All right. So maybe what we need to do to do this so job. This is, right? um, you want me to share? Yeah. Maybe what we should do is share her minutes, make our changes on screen, and then vote to approve those minutes as amended. Okay, so these are the questions Judy is asking. Okay. So the first one is this section here. Okay, let's let me see. Let's and see. this is her question. She said they are. You could actually delete that whole. That's yeah. my recommendation. Just strike which he said they are. But they aren't. No, then it then would have to be would be. Why don't you just say, go ahead, just take out the reference to what he had said previously and just include Lansberger mentioned types of manufacturing uses. So strike from here to yeah 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 i agree with that that looks good to me i agree as well yes and then do we need the whole bylaw draft text because it's below and no i think it should be shortened because this is attached yeah. in the other documents. Down. Somewhere. Yeah. Ooh, these are long ones, Mary. Yeah. Yeah, right. yeah so it's going to be there anyhow. So there we are. Yeah, I think that should be fine without that included. Okay, so I propose we amend Judy's amendments to skip the highlighted sentence we have here and to remove the bylaw references text. Second. Sounds good to me. Um, hmm. So can we then just vote to approve the minutes as amended and then expect that uh, Mary will follow our rec our requests. That's what we just did. Okay. I think we need to send her the copy with the accepted changes because her she doesn't use words. So right. 
Would you like she, to she wind up retyping you? everything? Or would you, Judy, would you be willing to? Sure, I'll do that. Awesome. So I vote to amend, to approve them as amended, amended. Okay. Donna, I think second. second did that. All right. So roll call vote. Sarah, well, you made the yes. motion, so you're, oh. Tom? Aye. Judy? Aye. Grant? Aye. Don? Aye. Okay. Minutes are approved. And so I think we're done. I know you had to, I will only say in, as you depart Don, that you sent around an email about the width of Gray Oak Lane that I just completely didn't understand. So, but that can be, I think dealt with at a future For the meeting. next zoning map revision will include that. Yeah. All right, well, I did, adios I did, everybody. Okay, good night. So I think we're going to um, move to adjourn. Next meeting. Second. Uh, second, all right. Uh, and we'll talk about the next meeting. And well, maybe before we adjourn. <laughs> so the motion has been made and seconded. Uh, our next meeting is uh, we're, we're not having one on the 26th. We agreed not to do that. So, so we're free. And then our next regularly scheduled meeting is on. August 30th, Wednesday, August 30th. Um, so that will be our next meeting, unless we can find a reason not to meet. Okay. Very good. Um, so all in favor of adjourning? We have to do that, right? Yeah. Aye, aye. Tom? Aye. Okay. All right. Meetings adjourned. <laughs>